So now let me introduce to you today's speaker. Um, you may remember her if you attended our harm reduction webinar. Mira Corey is a coordinator with the Maryland Harm Reduction Training Institute. Ms. Corey is a Morgan State University graduate with a bachelor's degree in psychology. She has six years of experience with the Lighthouse Studies at Pierpoint and B Shore, which are two harm reduction research programs through Johns Hopkins University, which focus on Baltimore City residents with HIV, STD, high risk behaviors. Mira, Mira is the former evaluation coordinator for Wraparound Systems of Care and the National Child Traumatic Stress Initiative programs at the Institute for Innovation and Implementation, which is a part of the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And this is before she, was, she joined Behavioral Health System Baltimore. So again, Mira, welcome and thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Tiffany and everyone for uh, inviting me um, and for having me back. Um, I'm super excited to uh, share this information um, with you all. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen and uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. So, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, today's training objectives and uh, agenda. So, by the end of the training, you all should um, understand stigma and the impact it has on people who use drugs, understand how trauma and racial injustice have impacted communities, um, understand um, how to respond to stigma in the workplace. And the agenda for today is to define stigma and its impact on people who use drugs, um, to take a look at the science behind stigma, um, look at the history of drug criminalization in America, do some questions and some wrap up. So uh, the stigma, trauma, and people who use drugs training is typically uh, a three-hour training uh, done in one setting, uh, but due to scheduling constraints and so on and so forth, we split them. We I split the training into two, so you're getting two 90-minute sessions. So today is the first session, and then uh, next week uh, will be will be part two. Just to uh, let you know. And so these training objectives and agenda cover both sessions. So stigma, right? We've heard it, we talk about it, we've used it both uh, in our work and used it colloquially, like, but like what is stigma, right? And so here we here we have uh, Justice Potter Stewart when he's talking about obscenity, but this concept is still the same, right? I know it when I see it. Like, I don't I don't really know what stigma is. Like, I can't point to it like that's a tomato, but I know it um, if I see it, right? And so that that is how a lot of folks view stigma, right? They, you ever have a situation where you know it's not quite right? But you're like, I can't really, mm. and that's how a lot of people view stigma, so especially when it's not so overt. Um, and so people who use drugs uh, and who are usually marginalized and stigmatized, they may not know what it is, but they know it when they see it. Okay. So the wheel of stigma and drug criminalization. Okay. So why does drug criminalization matter when we're talking about stigma? Like, why are these two connected? So if you can see on this uh, wheel, we have uh, four big domains. We have 
social stigma, which are poor outcomes uh, that all that can also reinforce stigma. You have the societal rationale for criminalization. Then you have the criminalization compounds and how that reinforces the stigma. And then that turns into poor out poor health and other outcomes. But it's like a wheel, right? So, you know, you think about it's kind of like a chicken or the egg argument. So is it that someone starts using drugs that they get stigma or become stigmatized, which kind of leads them down, could potentially lead them down to the path of incarceration and poor health and hygiene? Or is it the stigma that they faced out in the world which led them to find solace in substances which then are now criminalized and stigmatized, which then leads to poor health outcomes, right? Or you could start the wheel at the poor health outcomes. You know, what if somebody is sick and has a chronic, dis chronic illness? Um, especially if it's a silent illness, say like um, MS, where early on you may not, or depending on the symptoms, you may not be able to see it, but then you're parked in the handicap space, but you pop out the truck looking what folks consider normal, which is a societal construct, of course. But so then you're stigmatized, like, oh, why are they happen? Why are they in a parking space for handicapped people? Like, oh my goodness. But nobody's understanding the silent struggle that someone's going through, which could lead them down a path to this cycle, right? So these are all the different ways that you could hop on this wheel in different locations. But there is one uh, key, and yes, you're right, mental illness, that is also true, uh, Tiffany. And so what is the third key factor that might be missing off this wheel? You can put it in the chat or you can shout it out. What do you think it might be? All right, we got to vote for trauma. Anyone else? So trauma, mental health. Oh, excuse me. Uh, trauma, mental health, but one of those key factors that we don't talk about that is like the silent one, which you guys are seeing, I'm seeing in the chat up in my top hand corner, you guys are seeing it, race, racism. That is the, that is the silent player, the silent undercurrent. And so today, um, the first half of this training is really to spark conversations. So I'm gonna show um, a lot of uh, video clips and then take a pause to, you know, check in with you guys to see if the, if the clips that I show uh, spark some sort of conversation uh, or questions. Um, depending on time, we may have to hold them towards the end or we may be able to get them uh, in the middle, uh, depending on how talkative folks are. So. Let's talk about this clip. It's called The House I Live In, and it's talking about a brief history of the drug laws in America. And the clips that I'm going to be showing you today were very interesting to me the first time I saw them, and they're still interesting every time that I see them. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your perspective. So I'm going to go ahead and play that now. Nope, 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 nope. Don't do the thing. Do this thing. Looking to find out more about the longer history of drugs in America, I found an unlikely source in Lincoln historian Richard Miller. His research put drug laws in a fascinating historical context. Historically, anti-drug laws have always been associated with race. In the 1800s, certain kinds of drugs that are illicit today were common in this country. Cocaine was widely used, heroin. People using drugs was something that was just ordinarily accepted. Opium, for example, was used by middle-aged successful whites 
often housewives in the South. If people were addicted or abusing drugs, they were viewed sympathetically as people who had to be helped. It was seen as a public health issue rather than a crime issue. Well, one of the first changes was on the West Coast when smoking opium was made a criminal offense. Now, why would opium smoking be illegal in California, but not in Mississippi? What was going on in California that was a concern about smoking opium? Well, as it turns out, it had nothing to do with opium itself. The concern was with the people associated with smoking opium, and that was the Chinese who had come to this country, and many of whom were in California, working hard, working for very little pay, and becoming part of the American success story. But their success was taking jobs away from white workers. So politicians got together and decided they got to find something about the Chinese for which they can be criminalized to get them out of the way. Now, of course, you can't throw people in jail simply because they're Chinese, but you can throw them in jail because they smoke opium. In the same way, we saw things going on with cocaine. Again, it was middle-aged, successful people in this country business executives, physicians, housewives, all perfectly legal. But then around the turn of the century, cocaine began being associated with blacks. They could withstand police bullets, it was thought. They can work hard all day, all night long, and all day long again, threatening the jobs of white workers. And so laws began to be passed against cocaine. You're not arresting these people officially because they're black. You're arresting them because they've committed some sort of drug violation. Next, of course, we see the change in reputation that hemp has had. Hemp was a legitimate crop from colonial times forward, a widely appreciated commercial product. But then in the 1930s, hemp changed into something vicious and fearsome called marijuana, because at that time, marijuana smoking was being associated with Mexicans, working hard, working cheap. And once again, what was being outlawed was not being Mexican, but just some habit associated with Mexicans. These laws set up a very dangerous precedent of racial control. So I want to stop sharing just for a quick second. Um, and just check in really quickly. Like, what did that, like, how do you feel about what you just heard? How does this you know, sit in your brain, sit in your body with the things that you have historically known about drugs and drug criminalization. And you can put it in the chat or you can take yourself off mute. So I'm seeing that that information is new to folks. Uh, you know, some feels familiar, some, you know, is, is, this is new. Some are saying, you know, huh, didn't know, but not surprised, right? Especially, you know, the, <laughs> I think I find I find that this particular training um, is, is more powerful and more poignant after everything, <laughs> with everything that's going on in the world right now. Like every single, I'm like, I need to run this back. Anybody knows anybody on Capitol Hill? I, I'd love to let them watch this. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, when people using substances looked a certain way, everything was all good. You know, um, I don't know if you caught it, but in the beginning of the video clip, there was a bottle of prescribed heroin and it was it was manufactured by Bayer, as in Bayer aspirin, as in the people that you're the, the companies uh medication that you're supposed to take in times of heart attack like this was just you know over the count kind of like over the counter type stuff or prescribed by your doctor 
or like, you know, the running joke is, you know, Coca-Cola keeps coming out with all of these different flavors of Coke, but everybody just, just put the cocaine back in it. Like, because cocaine is, was the activating ingredient, right? You know, and it was like a thing that you would go to the soda shop for, and it was like a whole thing. And then people started using these drugs that did not look like the intended population or the intended market, and boom, now we're outlawing activities and substances um, for interesting reasons. So I'm going to go back and share my screen. Let's move on, um, hopefully. Uh, things will, you'll, you'll find some interesting things. So here we go. So the war on drugs. Now, these are some of my favorite, favorite quotes. When I say that I repeated this information to my 77-year-old father over lunch, my man stopped mid-fork, mid, like mid-fork, because let me show you. The war on drugs. And somebody in the chat already mentioned it. Don't you, don't steal my thunder. You want to know what this is really all about? This is about the Nixon campaign in 1968. And in 1968, the Nixon White House had two enemies, the anti-war left and Black people. Which, by the way, I'm both, but hey. No, it's none of your business. You know, it's no big deal. But yes, the anti-war left and black folks, right? You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. I need you to see that. I'm going to run it back one more time. By getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both of them heavily, we could disrupt those communities, right? This is the Nixon administration, straight from the horse's mouth. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night vilify them night after night on the evening news. And did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Of course. That was John Ehrlichman, the domestic policy chief of the Nixon administration in Harper's Magazine, 1994, letting you know that our government, and granted, we've all, we've all had a few of the conspiracy theories, like, hmm, is the government doing these things? Like, yes, yes, they are, directly from the horse's mouth. They knew that all they had to do is attack folks night after night. Think about what you see on the news, what you see, what you saw on the news in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the aughts, in the 20s. It is the same blueprint over and over and over again. I can't criminalize you for being not my targeted audience, but I can criminalize 
everything about you, everything that you do that is seemingly tied to you or that is negative and I can tie it to you and your community and then I can just vilify it, vilify you every night, every night. So, yeah, this is this is what stigma looks like. This is where it starts. This is how it this is the, this is like the blueprint. And I want folks to understand that this is this is top down and bottom up, right? Because once you get the 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 one of the good one of the few times that you know the trickle down Reaganomics works, you know, you get the top to spread all of this information, and then the bottom will buy into it, and the two in the middle they will meet, which is pretty much where we've been for the past like forty. Well, I'm forty three, so that many years. <laughs> like you know, this is like the thing. So let's talk about a history of the war on drugs. Cause you know, um, war on drugs. I don't know if you've been counting, but I'm pretty sure the drugs are winning, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. In 1986, when I was coming of age, Ronald Reagan doubled down on the war on drugs that had been started by Richard Nixon in 1971. Drugs were bad, fried your brain, and drug dealers were monsters, the sole reason neighborhoods and major cities were failing. No one wanted to talk about Reaganomics and the ending of social safety nets, the defunding of schools and the loss of jobs in cities across America. Young men like me who hustled became the sole villain and drug addicts lacked moral fortitude. In the 1990s, incarceration rates in the U.S. blew up. Today we imprison more people than any other country in the world. China, Russia, Iran, Cuba. All countries we consider autocratic and repressive. Yeah, more than them. Judges' hands were tied by tough on crime laws and they were forced to hand out mandatory life sentences for simple possession and low-level drug sales. My home state of New York started this with Rockefeller laws. Then the feds made distinctions between people who sold powder cocaine and crack cocaine even though they were the same drug. Only difference is how you take it. And even though white people used and sold crack more than black people, somehow it was black people who went to prison. The media ignored actual data to this day. Crack is still talked about as a black problem. The NYPD raided our Brooklyn neighborhoods while Manhattan bankers openly used coke with impunity. The war on drugs exploded the U.S. prison population disproportionately locking away black and Latinos. Our prison population grew more than 900 percent. When the war on drugs began in 1971, our prison population was 200,000. Today it is over 2 million. Long after the crack era ended, we continued our war on drugs. There were more than 1.5 million drug arrests in 2014. More than 80% were for possession only. Almost half were for marijuana. People are finally talking about treating addiction to harder drugs as a health crisis. But there's no compassionate language about drug dealers. Unless, of course, we're talking about places like Colorado, whose state economy got a huge boost by the above-ground marijuana industry. A few states south in Louisiana, they're still handing out mandatory sentences for people who sell weed. Despite a boom in its celebrated 50 billion legal marijuana industry, most states still disproportionately hand out mandatory sentences to black and Latinos with drug cases. If you're entrepreneurial and live in one of the many states that are passing legalized laws, you may still face barriers participating in the above ground economy. Venture capitalists migrate to these states to open multi billion dollar operations, but former felons can't open a dispensary. Lots of times those felonies were drug charges, caught by poor people who sold drugs for a living, but are now prohibited from participating in one of the fastest growing economies. Got it? In states like New York, where holding marijuana is no longer grounds for arrest, police issue possession citations in black and Latino neighborhoods at a far higher rate than other neighborhoods. Kids in Crown Heights are constantly stopped and ticketed for trees. Kids at dorms in Columbia 
where rates of marijuana use are equal to or worse than those in the hood are never targeted or ticketed. Rates of drug use are as high as they were when Nixon declared the so-called war in 1971. 45 years later, it's time to rethink our policies and laws. The war on drugs is an epic fail. So, <clears throat> I like that clip for several reasons. A, shout out to Hove, um, who's always been very honest about, you know, his struggle, his, you know, rags to riches story, if you will. But not only that, like, it shines such an important light, right, on what we're seeing. So um, I'm a pop culture person, right? So I want to I wanna give you, if you're a pop culture person like me, I'm going to give you a visual. I'm going to do two scenarios. When we are talking about the differences in the mandatory minimum sentences for cocaine versus crack and like the perception of who's using what and where it's chic and cachet, if you will, versus, you know, hood, ghetto, whatever you want to call it, right? I want you to understand that the Wolf of Wall Street, that part of the 80s, and New Jack City, it's the, it's the same. It's the same time. It's, it's all happening at the same time. It's just from two different perspectives. With, you know, uh, Jordan Kalkis? who was in the Wolf of Wall Street, my man is snorting coke off the backs of women who, A, aren't his wife and are in his workplace. Like, not even in the copy room, just in the office. And everybody is like, this is great and we're making money and we're cool. And then right down the road, you have folks like Nino Brown and all those folks who are, you know, running from the cops and, and trying to basically eke out a way to survive. And yet, nobody is looking at Jordan and his crew who not only are they doing drugs, copious amount, they're also stealing a crap ton of money, but we're not talking about that part yet. But, you know, these are two totally different perspectives. If you want to think about it even in the same movie, yeah, Pookie, yeah, buddy. If you even want to think about it in the same movie, think about Forrest Gump. You've got Jenny in her little shimmery dress, having a cocaine experience dancing on a table that's leading to a ledge. She started to get a little loopy out there towards the end. But you have that going on at the same time where Forrest Gump is meeting with Black Panthers who are hiding from the same people who Jenny and her crew should be scared of, but they're walking around with impunity and, you know, Black Panther folks are just trying to feed their families. Because why? Because they can disrupt their community because not only are they anti-war left, but they're also Black and they're also trying to keep it within them, their own communities. So, again, a lot of the stigma and trauma that people who use drugs face are rooted in racism, both institutional and internal and societal, right? Because it is criminalizing their race without having to say so, but it's very ob obvious as to how folks are pursued, right? 
Just bear that in mind. So this is a lot of words on the page, so I am going to I'm going to kind of paraphrase it for you. So stigma is a process by which the reaction of others spoils normal identity. So the term stigma then will be used to refer to an attribute that is deeply discrediting, but it should be seen that a language of relationships, not attributes, is really needed. By definition, of course, we believe the person with a stigma is not quite human. On this assumption, we exercise varieties of discrimination through which we effectively, if often unthinkingly, reduce his life chances. What this boils down to is that stigma is a relational, societal, social phenomenon, so that manifests differently both by society and over time. So I'm going to give you an example. When I was coming up, people who were a little different, um, they, you know, maybe they had some outbursts or did some things. Uh, they rode a different bus to school. Maybe they were in different classrooms than, you know, of myself or maybe yourself, right? Now, moving, like, by further understanding what some of those differences are, we now have the autism spectrum. Uh, which can help to identify some of these differences. And now we have a, by taking away the stigma of those that act differently, now we have a movement of neurodiversity battling what is considered neurotypical behavior and challenging what is neurotypical and what is considered neurodivergent, or as we say, like to say, spicy brains, um, you know? And so it took the stigma of being different, of being annexed to that different part. And now the stigma is, well, why are you looking at somebody who's a little neuro spicy? Why are you treating them like that? Now the stigma is back on to those who used to be the person's delivering the stigma which i mean i'm not pro stigma but i'm just saying like it's interesting how it's flip-flop now everybody wants to be on the neuro spicy train and i mean there's a lot of us but still it has changed over time socially like the, the needle has moved in our lifetime it has moved in front of our very eyes So defining stigma by Link and Phelan. We define stigma as the co-occurrence of its components. So the components of stigma are labeling, stereotyping, separation from the non-stigmatized, status loss as a result of the labeling, stereotyping, and separation, and then discrimination which is per perpetuated by the non-stigmatized with greater access to social, economic, political power that manifests as discrimination. And further indicate that for stigmati stigmatization to occur, power must be exercised. So for stigma to even happen, you have to have a power imbalance. You have to think that you are up here and that someone who is not like you for whatever reason is down here. And we do that with people with mental illness and how it may manifest. We do that with how people, with people who use drugs versus people who do not use drugs. We even do that within people who use drugs and the hierarchy or how we view people based on the drugs they use, right? We've all 
heard it colloquially, like out in the community. Oh man, I mean, I do crack, but I ain't a heroin addict. Like you're doing too much. Or Beth, what? Nah, 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 nah. I'm only doing ecstasy and zannies. Like meth, shh, you crazy for that. Like who does that? That's stigma. That is internalized stigma within the drug community, right? Because they have adapted and adopted these labeling and these separations and these stereotypes and put them on their community so that somewhere within their community, there's a hierarchy, right? I'm not there, I'm this. So I'm not a crackhead, I do coke. Y'all remember that Whitney Houston interview? It's too rich to do crap. Girl, no baby. <laughs> oh, I wanted to rub Whitney little head. But yes, so these are the components of stigma, right? And think about all of the different times that you have seen this, how you've seen this lately, daily. Think about your news programs. Think about it. How are they labeling folks? How are they stereotyping? How are they separating folks? Be mindful. So I want to talk about internalized stigma and oppression because I've mentioned it, but I want folks to really understand it. So there are four eyes of oppression. There's ideological, there's institutional, there's interpersonal, and then there's internalized. So when we're talking about these four eyes, we need to think about it as it parallels frameworks. The stigmatized or the oppressed come to believe the negative traits about themselves. Then the internalized stigma can be extremely powerful to influence people who use drugs. See how we're stacking those things? Stigmatized persons, in turn, may stigmatize their peers. Again, I don't do, I'm too rich to do crack. I too, baby, no. Mm. Acting out related to internalized stigma can look anything from passive powerlessness to aggressive violence. And internalized stigma has been found to be an independent risk for substance use problems and may represent a unique contributor. So how do they layer on each other, right? So I know it's a little blurry, so I'm gonna just read you the definitions. And I, I wanted to let you know how they stacked on each other before I gave you the, the definitions, because then I kind of wanna run it back. So your ideological oppression is a system of beliefs or ideas. The institutional oppression is using the laws, the legal system, the education system, public policy, media, political power, etc., to maintain said ideology. And then interpersonal is that the idea that one group is better than another and has the right to dominate or control the other group. And then internalize, the oppressor doesn't even have to exert any more pressure because we now do it to ourselves and each other. They don't even have to do anything more. We're doing the work for them, right? You can see these four eyes of oppression in pretty much any sense or any major social issue, particularly what's going on in the world right now. But people who use drugs have been dealing with these forever, right? All the way back to the opium dens and how we use it to 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 keep each other down and we take these four eyes of oppression and we we find new ways to oppress each other right so what may have just started as 
an activity that of one activity is better than the other can turn into colorism within one ethnicity. It can look, turn into classism. It can be all of these things. But these are your foundation, right? It's interesting that it's four. Four corners creates a level field of oppression. Can I get a time check and see if there are any questions? No questions, and um, it's 11.42, so we've got about another half hour before we get to general questions. Okay, great. Cool. And I second that. I didn't catch any either. Awesome. Thank you. So, here is a look at the brain disease model of addiction, which has been kind of like the new cachet, but also can create new issues. So on your left, you see what is considered old stigma. And then on the right, you have how the brain disease model of addiction can create new stigma. So that alternative theory that, you know, people who use drugs have a moral failing or they lack willpower. Um, so it pathologizes the people who use drugs. Desire, the disease model, it requires people to be sick, right? To be, to be part of this model, to be part of this thought, you have to be sick, which means you can be cured. And not all people who use drugs should be considered or do or consider themselves sick. And it may be interpreted that people who use drugs aren't ever to be trusted because their disease can reappear at any time. Well, you never know. Today might be the day that they snap. Got to. You got to walk around them like you're, you know, training a toddler to walk around the house. And that doesn't make anybody feel good because then there's no level of trust there. So old stigma would be enabling investigation into novel approaches and treatment. Or that it adds to our broader understanding of substance use disorder. So addiction is not a disease per se. There's no pathogen, there's no infection, there's no standard diagnosed diagnostic criteria listed as a disorder in the DSM-4. It's more similar to mental health disorders, a deviation from the norm with diagnostic criteria that may be refined over time. Right. So it's not like cancer is ABC. And that cancer. Barring some sort of, you know, minor chemistry, body chemistry between person A and person B, that cancer will look like A, B and C in the next person. That's not how this works. Substance use disorder does not work that way. And what it. The definitions or the diagnostic criteria changes over time the more that we understand things. Um, an old stigma would be offering additional evidence for health-based versus punitive approaches to solutions and may help alleviate self-blame among some people who use drugs. So by pathologizing or using a break a brain disease model, it can be disempowering, suggesting that biological problems are only healed through medical intervention. So that takes the, the self-efficacy and the self, you know, esteem and, 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 and autonomy away from the person, right? I mean, it, it makes, leaves people feeling like 
when left to your own devices, you will only choose drugs. If I take that away from you, if I take away your autonomy and say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and make all the decisions for you because in your hands, you're just going to do drugs, but I can heal you. Then what? That doesn't teach the person anything. It leaves them feeling untrusted um, and has no, gives them no hand in their own care. So we've got this last, I think this should be the last video um, that'll make you think. And this one's hard for me to watch because it triggers my rat phobia and I don't like rats, but enjoy. If there's one thing we all learned growing up, it's that drugs are bad, like really, really bad. We've been taught that addiction is inevitable and that addicts are completely irrational. But you might be surprised to learn that a lot of what we think we know about drugs and addiction comes from a series of studies done in the 1950s and 60s on rats. And it turns out that what we think we know, yeah, it might just be wrong. This is Bruce Alexander. I'm a psychologist with Simon Fraser University. Bruce has been studying addiction for almost 50 years. When he started back in the 70s, there was a huge public concern about heroin use and what many at the time described as a growing epidemic. The view was that heroin was essentially a demon drug. If you took it a few times, it would flip a switch in your brain and you would be forever addicted. That was it. You were doomed. And it was in the media, it was in the movies. But in those days, there was also a primary kind of research evidence that was used to support this idea. Much of that research used animal studies, particularly laboratory rats. Rats would be placed in really small cages called Skinner boxes. A Skinner box is a box which is just about three times the size of a rat. The experiments involved putting rats in Skinner boxes with a needle which was implanted in their jugular vein so that if the rats pressed the little lever on the wall, they would get a little surge of heroin in their bloodstream. Press the pedal, get a shot of heroin. Press the pedal, get another shot. And in some cases, they just kept pumping heroin into themselves to the point where they forgot to eat and would die. Beliefs about rat studies would find their way into PSAs and Hollywood films, and they would become part of our collective understanding of just how dangerous these drugs really were. These experiments seem to show that any creature, including even the lowly rat, if given access to heroin, would simply take lots and lots of it. But Bruce had another idea. What these experiments really show is that rats who are in solitary confinement will take lots of heroin. See, rats are very social animals. Rats don't normally spend their lives in harnesses with catheters shoved in their necks. They prefer playing with other rats, running around, you know, doing rat stuff. To put a rat in a Skinner box is to make this very, very social creature live a life of solitary confinement. Bruce and his colleagues wondered if maybe these rats were taking so many drugs because they were living in such an unnatural environment. So he organized his own rat experiment, but with some important differences. Most notably, he built a much bigger enclosure for them. About half as big as my garage floor, as a, as a matter of fact. Bruce and his colleagues filled it with everything a rat could want. Food, running wheels, and other rats to play with. He called it Rat Park. His team put a group of rats in the park and another group of rats in solitary cages. They made morphine freely available to both. The results were eye-opening. Giving the choice between plain water and morphine, the Rat Park residents chose the water. It's not like the rats in Rat Park totally abstained from morphine, but... You could say that they acted more or less like human recreational users of morphine. Bruce and his colleagues even tried an experiment where the rats in cages were giving nothing but morphine-laced water to drink for 57 days straight. In other words, we made sure they were good and addicted in terms of the conventional expectation. Every one of those rats should have been addicted for the rest of its life. But when they were placed in Rat Park, those same addicted rats generally chose to drink the plain water and voluntarily went through withdrawal. People were shocked that the rats in Rat Park had so little interest in morphine. The Rat Park study suggested a much more complex picture of addiction than many people had suspected. Addiction wasn't simply a story of chemicals rewiring our brains or hijacking our reward centers. 
Other factors like environment, feeling of isolation or hopelessness, poor social bonds, and lack of control all likely play an important role in what leads to addiction. Think about the implications for how we've been treating drug addicts. They're often shamed and ostracized, thrown in jail, moved into halfway houses. Instead of integrating them into society, you could say that we're kind of isolating them in cages, like rats. Doesn't seem like such a great idea. And more importantly, it doesn't seem like it's working. At the time it was published, the Rat Park study was largely ignored, but it's finally starting to gain traction today. It's literally taken 35 years for the Rat Park experiment to find its way into the popular understanding of addiction. In recent years, other researchers have replicated Bruce's studies and conducted new ones of their own, adding to our increasingly complex understanding of addiction. And that's great. With concerns over drugs and addiction still dominating the headlines today, a careful analysis and understanding of the research is more vital now than ever. After all, we're never going to get the treatment right if we're getting the diagnosis wrong. Subscribe to our show page and be the first to see new episodes of Wrong. So, right? Like I said, I'm 43 years old, which means I am McGruff the crime dog, dare, just say no age, right? Like that's me. This is my brain on drugs. If they smash that egg one more time, <laughs> when I was growing up or fried that egg one more time, like that's that's how I grew up. The one and done. All it takes is one one hit of heroin, one hit of cocaine, and that's it. My mama will never see me again. I'm going to be out on the street. All of that, right? Because I am officially hooked. And then I became an adult and I started working in harm reduction. And I was like, wait, my life is a lie? What happened? What? Because for those who don't know, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, which means I am quite familiar with the Skinner box and, you know, all of those things. And I'm like, wait, wait, you know, and I can tell you for the record, there has only ever been two things in my life that was a one and done, you know, addiction. That is coffee and chocolate cake. That's it. And you can pry either one of them from my cold, dead hands. But I can go from being a casual user, or I can go to, we could have a really bad toxic relationship, but that's okay. Those are my boobs. But I say all that to say, if you grew up like me, this is what your whole, like, thought process was around. This is what this experiment, the rat, the rat experiment is what, like the foundation of what our drug education was based on. And to find out as an adult that it was a bunch of crap. And it was because if you take a social animal and you isolate it from its entire social ecosystem and make them feel ostracized and stay in a little box that's only three times their size and your choices are get high to disassociate and to not feel the isolation or to stare at those four walls you got darn right those rats are going to take that heroin and so will people You gotta, you, you gotta flip the switch, right? So when we think about how we treat people who use drugs in this country, that's what we do. We treat them like the first set of rats. We put them in cages. We isolate them. We see them on the street and we step over them or cross the street or act like we don't see them. We isolate them. We kick them out of the family. They can't keep a job. They can't get a job, right? Because, you know, you're drug testing them. 
And, but you don't realize that maybe, you know, the person on the street is using the drugs so that they can stay awake because they don't have a place to sleep and I need to use the drugs so I can stay awake so I don't get raped and so my stuff doesn't get stolen. But if I could have even just a little job, maybe at the 7-Eleven, which as long as I'm awake, I'm really not sure why it matters if I use heroin, if I want to ring up this um, hot dog. But if that can afford me enough money to pay for subsidized rent, then maybe my usage would go down. And then you'll start seeing, you know, negative urinalysis because now I have a roof over my head and I have some sort of steady income and I don't have to worry. And then I have coworkers and maybe these coworkers might want to be my friend. And now I have a social ecosystem. And so maybe instead of doing heroin because I'm lonely, maybe my coworker and I can sit outside and drink a Coca-Cola and have a cigarette and have a conversation. And that makes me feel full. That makes me feel like a part of this society, it makes me feel like a person. So now I don't have to go home and disassociate with my heroin. Think about it. Think about it. Oh, hey, look. We've come to the end, and it was quicker than I thought. So uh, I want to kick it over to your questions, comments. How did you feel watching, listening? I want to hear from you. I've been talking, so go, go for it. And I have the chat open so I can read, and I can, or you can take yourself off of mute. The Nixon administration info was very interesting. In my facility, we seem to be the staff and treating it differently. That feeling of stigma that may or may not be okay. Oh, mute function is controlled by the host. Ha <laughs> ha! Thank you. Yeah, that's the norm. They typically don't. Um... Unmute folks. Sorry. That's okay. But I was going to take a shot. I was like, oh, people can do it. Let them do it. <laughs> <laughs> I just read something in the in the chat and I was like, maybe somebody's talking. I can't hear them. Um, let's see. I see that. Oh, I have my hand raised whenever you have time. Allie, go ahead. Ali Sawyer. Uh, Tiffany is saying Ali Sawyer can't unmute herself. Hear me? There you go. Perfect. Yeah, I just had um, a quick comment. I am a community health specialist at a local health department here in Ohio, and a lot of my work has been predominantly revolved around um, Narcan training. Uh, we got a big grant um, <clears throat> that distributed a lot of Narcan kits because um, due to our uh, overdose report, we felt that it was adamant to train and make aware in the community um, to train as many people as we could. Um, so I see the stigma on uh, drug use firsthand when I'm out trying to offer it to the community, especially when people are like, oh, no, I don't need that or think that it's absurd that we're even offering it in the first place. But aside from that um, comment on this webinar, I would just like to say I really appreciated how you posted this webinar and the way that you spoke because a lot of webinars that I attend, it's easy to lose concentration and focus when they're talking a certain way. And the way that you talk is relatable. You're talking like a person that's talking to people. And I wish more people talk like that because you can still be educated and 
hold people's attention by just talking straight relatable to people i just love the way that you spoke and talked and your analogies and comparisons like you know i'm too rich to be on crack like blah 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 you know like yes i wish more people talk like this because it actually holds my attention and focus and i'm here for the whole entire thing and i yeah i mean every webinar that you host i'm about to sign up for but i just appreciate that thank you Oh, you're gonna make me tear up. Oh, that's awesome. Because I have been dinged on my <laughs> on my presentation before. So people tell tell me that because I talk that way or I talk this way, they assume that I don't take my job seriously, and I take my job extremely seriously. And I think this topic is very serious, but we're also human, and you gotta find the levity somewhere because this. This work is hard, dude. It is hard. I try to tell people every day. So I have a brother, brother that's closest to me, who is very non-PC. Not maliciously so, but just non-PC. And so when I tell him, when I'm trying to explain to him what I do, I'm like, I try to teach people how to treat other people like people. And it's difficult because I have to advocate for people's person's ho personhood both professionally and personally because when i'm talking to people in my personal life i still have to correct them no i don't say that that's not how we say that that's that's not cool like i'm in a text message last night had somebody one of my good friends misgender purposefully caitlin jenner for what she has been saying about dylan uh mulaney and i'm like I don't rock with Caitlyn like that, but you're not going to disrespect her in my text message just because she's saying some BS. And I say all that to say, I can have a funny conversation. I can have a, a, a educational conversation, but we all have a good time because that's how you have a conversation with people. I don't like to lecture folks. So question from rebecca can i talk more about countering internalized oppression and stigma i can see how this new information this is new to me information and that the rat part helps so when we are talking about internalized oppression and internalized stigma there are certain places you will hear terms and phrases that are, those are what I like to call friendly, friendly fire zones, right? So when we're talking about an NA meeting or an AA meeting, something like that, you will hear people using stigmatizing language, right? Even your more, even your most hardcore harm reductionist, you will hear them say, I'm an addict. I'm a crackhead, I'm a junkie, da, da 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 That is an area that is like a friendly fire zone. That is not, while there is internalized stigma in there, it's because that is their safe space and that is for them to use their language the way that they want to. So when I am telling you this, I'm using, I'm not counting that area, right? But in general, when you are talking to your folks and you hear them say, oh, yeah, I mean, I use drugs, but like, I'll use like hard drugs. Or if you're doing your outreach and you're like, hey, you know, here's some Narcan. And they're like, oh, no, 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 I don't, I, don't, I don't need that. I only use um, ecstasy and like some poppers and maybe like a little coke. That is when it is time for you to step in and say, hey, first of all, it's not I just I just only do X, Y, and Z, or I just only do this. It is I use these things. Other people use these things. There is no better. There is no worse. But you can all use this information and you can all use this product. And it is better to have it than not have it talking to your folks about what is the root of the stick the internalized stigmatization that they're that they're feeling 
talking to them about why is it that you feel like you are, you as someone who smokes crack, why do you feel like that behavior is more socially acceptable than someone who injects heroin, all right? Asking them, where's that mentality coming from? Like, what is it that you see? Is it because they use needles? Is it because you see them nodding on the street? Is it because you just seem like it is, it's a harsher drug? Why do you feel that way? And kind of picking that apart for folks, right? Shining a light on it. Because the flip side of that is someone who injects drugs, who might be experiencing internalized stigma, could look at somebody who uses crack and be like, okay, yeah, I nodded on the corner out there by Lexington Market, but I didn't steal my mama's TV. And see, we are not the same. Again, again, it is behaviors that people see in other, and they just need a leg up over someone else, right? And that brings us back to the Ehrlichman statement, right? The Nixon administration needed a leg up on the American populace because they felt like they were losing control. So the easiest way to do that is to demonize and stigmatize and vilify folks every night just so that they could root that message in society and then society would go and do the rest of the work, right? They put it on TV, it seeps into your brain, and then you can go out into the world and do the work for them and see people in your own community and be like, ugh, like how can you put that in your system? How could you do that? And while, you know, I am one of those people who feel like one behavior is not worse than the other, I'm also a believer of people in glass houses should not throw stones. So while you are turning up your nose and you are eight cheeseburgers deep with like four vodka gimlets and three whiskey sodas and it's noon, now might not be the time to speak because you have things to address on your own, just like this person, right? It's no different, it's no better, it's no worse, it is the same. But society and stigma wants you to, someone's gotta have the upper hand. That was really long, sorry about that. Um, so the next part of this is gonna talk, there's gonna be, I think there's a, maybe one more clip, but it's going to actually be more talking about how stigma shows up in your workplace, how it shows up in your personal life, and how to combat that, what modeling a stigma-free workplace looks like. Um, and then if you're interested at any other point, we do um, at the Maryland Harm Reduction Training Institute um, have a few other trainings. Um, we do have a Drugs 101 series, which talks more in depth about the most commonly used uh, categories of drugs, the harm reduction um, techniques for those classifications of drugs. It talks about the historical implications of um, uh, drug criminalization in America, and so on and so forth. Um, so that may be of interest to folks. Uh, I see Candace saying, creating the dog whistles that are used and manipulated to this day. Look, if it ain't broke, <laughs> don't fix it. That's the way this world works, right? It is, it, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing, right? So Justin, and just in case, right? So if you want to hear, if you want to hear the flip side of it, this is how the dog whistle went wrong. So we saw what happened in, in, in Tennessee with ousting 
Justin and Justin, right? Then like the very next day, the GOP folks said, wait, wait, we did it wrong because now we've made them angry, right? We rang the dog whistle in the wrong direction. And so now we need to reinstate them because we've triggered the wrong base. If uh, take a moment to uh, click the evaluation link that Tiffany so generously provided uh, in the chat. Um, it would go a long way for helping me to improve um, this presentation and presentations in the future. Um, am I missing any questions, comments? I'm so glad you guys enjoyed today. I really enjoyed having you. I loved seeing all of the comments that were coming up in the corner <laughs> um, and the reactions. Um, I really enjoyed that. Awesome. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.